Welcome back to part four. In this part, we'll do several exercises to cover what we've learned. For our first exercise, it'll be really simple. We'll write a program to read in three values from the user and print their average. I'll create a new file called average. The first part to any program is going to be the header the documentation that identifies the author and what the purpose of the program is. We need to include the standard library and the standard input output library because we'll be doing some input and output. The main function serves as our main entry point. Let's go ahead and declare three variables to hold the values that we'll read in from the user. In general, these are bad variable names, but since they're not really modeling anything in particular, they're okay in this instance. We use printf to prompt the user to enter their first number. And scanf to read it in. Remember %d is the placeholder for an integer. And don't forget your ampersand. We'll read in the second two numbers likewise. Now let's go ahead and compute the average. We declare it as a double because the average may not necessarily be an integer. Now let's print it back to the user. We print the user's input back out to them to give them feedback that their input was accepted. Let's go ahead and compile and run this. It seems like it works, but one test case is not enough to determine whether or not it actually works. Let's try another. This is clearly wrong. The average of 5, 7, and 11 is 7 and 2 thirds, not 7. Let's go back to our code and identify what happened. A, B, and C are integers. We declared average to be a double because the average of three integers may not necessarily be an integer. But when we went to calculate that average, we took an integer plus an integer plus an integer, which results in an integer, and then divided by an integer, resulting in truncation. At least one of these arguments needs to be a double. We could have done it in the denominator, or we could have done an explicit typecast. Let's compile and try again. The first example still works. And now the second example works. Of course, two test cases are not sufficient for what's called code coverage. You should test as many values as necessary to give a higher assurance that your code is correct. Corner cases such as zero or negative value should also be tested. One more thing I wanna show you. If you forget the ampersand, here's what's gonna happen. I've used the W flag here to suppress any warnings. Now when I enter the first number, it results in a segmentation fault. That's because I omitted the ampersand. 
We'll understand the details later on when we look at pass by reference and pass by value in functions. But for now, just remember that you need to include the ampersand when using scanf. Another point, our design does not allow a user to enter in anything other than an integer value. A, B, and C are all integers. So anything that the user inputs will only be allowed to be an integer. The user would not be allowed to compute the average of 1.5, 2.5, and 3.5, for example. In fact, it messes up the entire process. Let's go back and change that. By making A, B, and C doubles, we'll allow a wider variety of inputs. However, other things will need to change. LF is the proper placeholder value for doubles. And F is the proper placeholder value when printing them. And that's an even better program. Now let's write a program that prompts the user for the length of two sides of a right triangle and outputs the length of its hypotenuse using the Pythagorean theorem, where the hypotenuse is equal to the square root of the sum of squares. I'll create a new file for this called triangle.c. Again, documentation is necessary. We need to bring in the standard library and the standard input output library. As with the other program, let's declare our variables, prompt for the input, and read the input for both A and B. We'll make them all doubles off the bat. Now to compute the hypotenuse, we're going to have to use a built-in square root function that's available in the math library. The square root function is located in the math library, so we need to include it. Let's go ahead and test this program. When you're compiling on the CSE server, you'll need to use the flag hyphen LM, which stands for link in the math library. Using other configurations or other servers, this may not be necessary. The last is an example of a Pythagorean triple. Three, four, five are all integers, so I knew the answer up front. We can verify the other test cases by simply pulling out our calculator and doing the math. Let's try to fuzz or break this though. Let's give it input values that may not necessarily be correct or valid. A triangle cannot have a side that's negative or zero. But still, the math works out. This is obviously something that we're going to have to deal with eventually. When we get to conditionals, we'll learn how to validate input data. Let's write a program to calculate mileage reimbursement. We'll read in the beginning and the ending odometer readings of a car, as well as a per mile rate from the user, and display a total distance traveled as well as a total reimbursement.
I'll go ahead and fast forward through the boilerplate stuff. We'll need three variables to keep track of the beginning mileage reading, the ending mileage reading, and the rate per mile. These will all be doubles to accommodate fractional miles and cents. Notice my variable names. We're not using A, B, C, or H anymore. That's because these variables actually represent or model something. It's better to give them more appropriate names. In general, you shouldn't copy pasta like I just did. Copy pasta can lead to spaghetti code and copy paste errors that should be avoided. This is a simple enough program though that it's not that big of a deal. Now we could calculate the reimbursement all in one go, but I also want to print out the total miles traveled. So let's compute two things. and let's print out both of these values to the user. Let's go ahead and test this. So I drove 125.2 miles, and at 55 cents per mile, I mowed $68.86. The math works out, and everything is technically correct. This isn't how you typically display currency. It may make sense in the per mile reimbursement if you do allow fractional cents, but for the total, we probably don't want those trailing zeros. Let's fix that now. We'll only print two decimal points of accuracy. Now the actual computed value here was $275 and 5.5 cents. Printf is rounding up for us. Convenient, but however the value stored in the variable is still unchanged. It holds a value of 275.055. If we wanted to do this properly, we would want to actually round. Fortunately, the math library has a round function for us. This will round the value stored in reimbursement and then reassign it back into the same variable. As you can see, it rounds to the nearest whole number, which is not what we wanted. Here's a trick. We can shift the decimal point over by multiplying by 100. Then once we round, it'll be rounding into the nearest hundredth. After we're done rounding, we can simply correct our mistake. Reimbursement and the return value from round are both doubles, so we have no integer truncation issue here. And now we get the correct answer. We always have to be on the lookout for bad or invalid input values. Again, we'll learn how to deal with this when we get to conditionals. For our final exercise, we'll write a program to convert a number of days into a number of years. For simplicity, we'll assume 365 days a year, ignoring leap years. We'll convert a number of days into years, weeks, and 
and days remaining. For example, if the user enters 1,000 days, it would display as two years, 38 weeks, and four days. Again, for expediency, I'll go ahead and put in the boilerplate automatically. Now we'll need to prompt the user to enter in a number of days and read it in. Here, days is gonna be an integer. Now to compute the number of years, we simply divide by 365. This is actually exactly what we want. Years is an integer, days is an integer, and 365 is an integer. We don't want fractional years. Integer truncation will end up giving us two for an input value of 1000 here. To get the number of weeks remaining, we have to update the days variable to take off the days that we've already accounted for in the years. Now we can do the same trick for weeks. At this point, days contains the remaining days. So let's print it out to the user. Now let's try it out. We get the correct answer, mostly. Two years, 38 weeks, and four days. But the input value here is wrong. That's because we made changes to the variable that stored the user's input. Let's go back and fix that. To fix that, I'll simply create another variable preserving the original value and now I'll use this variable instead of the original value. And now the original value is preserved. You can always declare more variables if you need them, or if it's convenient. Let's try out some other corner case values. What about zero? What about 365 exactly? Or 366? Or one less than a full year? This is actually correct because a year consists of 52 full weeks plus a day. Again, you've got to be on the lookout for invalid inputs. Another type of invalid input is when you just have a user that refuses to follow instructions. It interpreted that as zero. That's how scanf works. It scans the input and tries to parse it as a number. Since it first sees F, it decides that it's done parsing, and so it'll interpret whatever it's parsed so far, which is nothing, as zero. Additional white space in general doesn't matter. Our programs are going to get a lot more sophisticated and complex as we start handling these situations.